Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you this morning as I offer these words to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, I, uh, lucky for you, I mean, this is a great day uh, because you get to listen to me preach on a series on the Nicene Creed. And that's exactly what you thought this morning. You thought when you woke up, I hope he'll preach on the Nicene Creed today. Uh, But I'm hoping that you will uh, uh, just listen a little bit, open yourselves up to some ideas here, because I think sometimes when we say the creed, we think of the creed almost as uh, uh, in a fundamentalist way, that we have to believe these things or else. And what I have been uh, preaching on is about how sometimes the creed opens for us kind of a center stripe, if you will, from which we can move uh, uh, around and sometimes boundaries. Uh, and today we've come to a passage uh, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And while this is the 11th in this series for me, one of the things I've been amazed at is how the scriptures continually echo the things that I'm talking about in the creed, as well as the service. And so as we go through today, it's really enlivened my own kind of sense of how the things that we say as we affirm the faith of the church and reaffirm our own faith are so deeply rooted in all of our prayers and the way that we come and approach as Episcopalians uh, our time together. And today what stood out for me was, who are these people? They are the ones who have been through the great ordeal. And for them, the one who sits upon the throne will care for. Or from the psalm, uh, that last verse, uh, the Lord ransoms the life of the servants, and none will be punished who trust in him. That sense of God's presence for us in that. And then lastly, those great uh, uh, words from the first letter of uh, John, Uh, uh, beloved, uh, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. And so I want to talk a little bit about all of this uh, with you, uh, and uh, I'm excited to be here and the opportunity to offer a few words. So, uh, for our salvation and for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. This is a key theological nexus, if you will. It's like a moment in the creed. Everything that's come before it comes to these, this phrase and the phrase that comes right after it and then goes back out. It's as if uh, we, are in, we are hearing the first followers of Jesus offer us what had the most important. And almost as if the rest of it is a struggling with what happens in these two phrases. The first followers of Jesus believe that Jesus, this very unique human being, was different than all other human beings. There is no question, as we read the scriptures, that comes clear. And we're talking about a span of like 60 years. Our first followers, those who witness Jesus, are uh, offering a tradition that this person is unique. And it is true that they may not have all agreed on what all of this meant, by the way, because they're human beings, right? So we need to remember they had lots of different views, and that's why it's sometimes hard as we read the whole scripture, as my professor used to say, well, I agree with my friends, right? (laughs) Because it's hard to know what we're agreeing with sometimes, and the scripture offers us different perspectives. But what we know is that they believe that Jesus was unique and that he had uh, come uh, to save us. 
that he believed he had come to save us. I once had a, a professor in seminary who said that, listen, if we don't believe that Jesus thought that when he went into Jerusalem something was going to change, we might as well go home. Uh, and this, uh, the scripture in every form is just very clear, those first testimonies, that Jesus believed something powerful was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem. Now, we could debate whether or not he knew what was going to happen all, all day long, but I'm not going to do that today because we have other things we're going to do, uh, and though I could go on for hours, uh, I won't. Rob said I couldn't. <laughs> so if you have questions about what I bring up today, please, by all means, ask Rob. Uh, he is prepared and ready to answer them all. Uh, but they narrowed down. So in the first couple of hundred years, they narrowed down. Like, okay, so what's the basics of the faith that we have to, we have to stick to? Uh, uh, and it was this. Jesus came to save us. That's, this is kind of one of the core pieces. And that saving act had multiple components to it, that's for sure. But that Jesus did this freely. Right? So he does this of his own accord. And that's very important. He was crucified. This is a truth among criminals. He really did die, and he really was buried. And I want to focus on that today. That's where we are today, right? Uh, you'll have to listen to my podcast to get next week's sermon, what happens next. You might know what happens next, but that's, that's, uh, that's for you to find out later. Um, and I will tell you that lots of people do dispute this very fact. And that's a nice theory. <laughs> but I would suggest that the first followers of Jesus and those who heard their stories and also followed Jesus believed he, he did die and was buried. And to say, oh, this is a theory, denies witness. And you all have your own journey and life whereby you make witness, which is true, is it not? So we can't deny the first witness's experience of this man. And uh, 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 I would say that as we, as we continue, uh, uh, there are two pieces to this. First, the first followers who knew Jesus understood this as self-sacrifice. Now, you may have heard... Lots of other theories, uh, and there are. There are lots of theories about what happened. And over the years, some of those theories have been more popular than others. But sticking to the creed, the creed doesn't give us all those theories. The creed says that he went and he did this and this happened to him. And so we could just stick right there. We don't have to solve all the theological stuff about what was happening. And I find, for instance, uh, if, you, if you wanted to do that, you could go get the giant book. It's huge. It's a lot better to get it on e-books, by the way. Uh, Fleming Rut Rutledge is amazing, amazing, where she goes in. And I think it's like 12 or 14 chapters of the different theories about what's happening. And then she picks the one that she likes the best. Uh, truthfully, uh, you gotta, you're going to need to spend some time on that if you're really curious. But, but there's... The reality is that there is no sense that God required this of him. And that's what I'm pointing out. There's no sense in the creed or in the scripture that the father required the son to die. In fact, that would have gone against the very story of scripture where child sacrifice is removed as an option of worshiping the Lord in the Old Testament. So God can't, in my mind, in my way of thinking, if we read the whole scripture, we can't use that theory. So just to say that there's a lot of stuff out there that you probably in your own journeys have heard. But let's make no mistake that Jesus, in his preaching, in his teaching, in his actions, in his healing, in the relationships that he had with other people, that Jesus was a selfless human being. And so we should not be surprised then that he arrives at the gates of Jerusalem to do a selfless act of giving himself to the people. And uh, 
God in this act, in this person of Jesus, then has done something for you. And now, some people say, well, uh, I didn't ask God to do it. But that's the thing about God. God doesn't care whether or not you ask God. You see, God in the person of Jesus, you've got to go back several lessons for that one. <laughs> but in the person of Jesus, where they saw this intimate connection between Jesus and the divine, he does a selfless act for his followers, for the people there in Jerusalem, for all people. He believes, Jesus, we would, we would say there's evidence in the scripture that he believes that this act will change the world. And that he believed that it would change not just the lives of the people present on that day, but all lives. And that this act itself... Uh, was such a powerful act that it would last for all time and all seasons. So we call that apocalyptic. Okay, that's your fancy word for your cocktail parties. You can go say, well, the bishop was saying apocalyptic, and I agree with that. Blah, 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 blah. But Paul says it, doesn't he? Who are these people? They're the people who've been through the ordeal. But Paul says nothing can separate them from the love of God. No powers, no authorities, nothing can separate them from the love of Jesus and his selfless act upon that cross. It is because Jesus believed that if we, he went to Jerusalem, was crucified, a work of salvation was going to take place. There's no shame in this act, by the way. Jesus doesn't go to the cross bemoaning all of our sins. Oh, I got to do this because of how terrible they all are. What does he say on the cross? Forgive them for they don't know what they do. True selflessness even in his last breaths. He believed so powerfully that though a friend might from time to time do something courageous for another friend, as the scripture says, it is not likely that many people will truly give their life for another. But I will. In these words that we say weekly, right? We stand up and we say weekly the Nicene Creed. We profess that Christ came for our salvation and died. In these words, that we believe, the church believes, even when some days I don't believe, or you may not believe, the church buoys us up with this framework, reminding us of this selfless act, that he acted sacrificially for all people in all places. And isn't that what St. Clair's is about? Isn't it about sticking to this tradition to say God loves all people and that nothing can separate anybody from God's love? In fact, I would say to say anything else is maybe not to have the faith of the church or to doubt Jesus' own self-sacrificing motives to say well God isn't powerful enough to save everybody that's not what we say at St. Clair's or in the Episcopal Church no God has acted on our behalf you see you must see that what we do by opening up a place to worship the God of love to do so freely and to share what we have and to do Jesus' work in the world is an outward reflection of this faith statement. It is to gather and to be in a world that denies God's power and self-giving self, uh, of God's love. Jesus came into the world for our salvation, which he accomplished by a very selfless act. He did so on behalf of his friends, and he has done so on your behalf. 
And that is amazing and good news, my friends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.